everybody. Hi. My name is Stuart Schlossman, and I too have MS. Can you imagine that? I know, it's hard to imagine these days. But anyway, yes, that's one of the reasons why we do everything we are doing, and I want you to know that we're just gonna get started with tonight's program. And Dr. Issa is here tonight to speak about access and options to medications, okay, as well as he's gonna speak about how to manage your disease. Also, he's gonna speak about sex and MS. Oh my gosh. He's got a hard role to play with that one. Then he's gonna speak about urinary continence, incontinence, I should say. And then we're going to do a 15-minute Q&A with Dr. Issa. So, Dr. Issa, how would you like to come on up? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak, Stuart. As usual, uh, it's a real honor. And I have been charged with going over lots of different topics today. And uh, we're going to start first with a little bit of an overview about medications, and we're going to transition to symptom management. We're going to talk a little bit about symptoms, how to manage things, how to manage symptoms, how to uh, try to relate those symptoms to your providers, your doctors, your nurse practitioners, your PAs. And we'll be talking a little about sexuality and MS, and really sexuality and having chronic illnesses, and how that impacts the individual and the relationships. And at the end, um, on urinary incontinence. So let's let's get started. That's a lot of topics, actually. You could probably talk about any one of those topics for 45 minutes. I'm trying to compress this uh, in a reasonable way. And at the end, with Q&A, please pay attention. If you have any questions, write them down. I'll be glad to go over anything in detail, repeat myself, and just make sure you guys uh, feel comfortable with what the topics that we're reviewing. So this is sort of the standard slides that we go over with just about every MS talk. And one of the things to focus on here is that MS predominantly affects women. About two thirds of the patients are female. And that um, it affects people during their early stages in life, during their more productive stages in life with regards to careers, during uh, times in their lives when relationships, uh, marriage, et cetera, are, are occurring. So it has a big impact uh, and p on people's lives during a very important stage in our development and in our, our uh, young adulthood, and it predominantly affects females. So um, the other thing I wanted to go over is a little bit just to review some of the way we try to define or explain about MS. We have a relapsing remitting MS, which is the one that most people are familiar with, which is about 85% uh, of individuals at the beginning will have the MS, will have a typical um, event some new neurologic symptom, those symptoms will improve to some degree, may completely resolve, and then later on in life, they'll have another event, and that's what we call relapsing remitting MS. A uh, small uh, percentage of people will have what's called primary progressive MS, and that's a, a type of multiple sclerosis that individuals notice a progression of disease from onset without any definite relapses or unique episodes of uh, neurologic impairment or disability. And then later on over time, it's, as you see here, about 11 to 15 years, a lot of people start to convert more to the, what we call secondary progressive MS, which means you have these relapses, these exacerbations, they tend to go away, and patients notice just this progression of disease and impairment without classic relapses superimposed, and then some people still progress with relapses. I wouldn't get too bogged down in all these terms, it's just one way to conceptualize how multiple sclerosis often starts out for people, and then how it evolves uh, from, an from a case of where you have more specific relapses and then you have some recovery. And then over time, it just seems like the MS progresses slowly. You have some decline in function uh, without classic uh, exacerbations or relapses. So there's this sort of evolution in the way MS uh, occurs in the lifespan of an individual. This is a very, this is a longstanding disease. This is not a disease that's gonna go away anytime soon. So it's gonna evolve some throughout the course of the person's life. So let me just uh, go over this slide here. So this is a little bit about the story of MS from a, from a medicine standpoint. And what's interesting, and I, I talk about this at different talks, about how multiple sclerosis was first described back in 1868, was first given the name of multiple sclerosis by a very famous neurologist, a guy called Charcot in 1868. And then 
In the early 1900s, there was some better description about what happens in the brains of people with multiple sclerosis, but really there was not much going on. So if you think about this, 1868, there's not much happening with the management of patients with multiple sclerosis until 1993. So for a really long period of time, you're seeing developments in the management of diseases that are affecting your heart, cancers, certainly major changes in the way we manage infections, major changes in the way we uh, handle uh, other diseases that humans succumb to, but really just nothing's going on in the uh, 20th century for the most part for multiple sclerosis until the early 1990s. So I started med school in 1988 and uh, graduated in 92, so I was a resident when interferon beta uh, 1b, which is beta seron, was approved for the treatment of MS. And some people might remember that when that first was approved, and there was actually a lottery that was out there to uh, get it to patients. There's been some evolution since then. In the 1990s, we saw, and I'm gonna go over some of this, as well, saw a real uh, change with multiple injectable medications, the interferon beta 1a's, which include things like Avonex, um, and Rebif, glitermer acetate, which is Copaxone in 1997, and first intravenous therapy uh, for multiple sclerosis, niadolizumab, which is Tysabri 2003. And then there's just been this real explosion of medications with pills that started coming out in the 2000s, and then a whole series of different medications, which I'll go over later on, called monoclonal antibodies. And so for a disease that did not have much, uh, much discovery of treatment, for all these years, in a very short period of time, from 1993, let's say to 2014, you've really seen quite a bit in 20 years with multiple sclerosis. So this is just a review of meds. One of the things that I'm uh, charged to do tonight is gonna go over medication. So I'll go over meds in three categories, sort of the first drugs that came out in the 1990s. Then we'll talk a little about oral agents, which is a fancy way of saying pills. And then we'll talk about these new infusions that have been out. So many of you are probably familiar with these drugs. I just referenced them a second ago. Drugs like Avonex, beta seron Rebif, and Copaxone. That's kind of the standard platform drugs, drugs that have been around for many, many years now. And then there's Glatopa, which is a generic form of Copaxone, and Plegrity, which is a modified form of interferon beta-1a or Avonex. So we have several injectable therapies still available to our patients. And then there's pills, what they call oral agents. Um, so there's Jelenia, Fingolimod, Tecfidera, which has got a long name, dimethylfumarate, and Albadria, which is teraflunamide. So if most of the people here are familiar with these names, you guys heard these before? Okay, good. So they've been out for several years and probably some people in the audience are or have either uh, tried these meds or are currently on these medications. And this was a big breakthrough. So moving from these injectable therapies where people were uh, committing to taking these injections um, sometimes once, uh, you know, several times a, a week or once a day, uh, once a week. Uh, there was over time, as you moved into five years, eight years of therapy, 10 years of therapy for some patients, there was this idea of needle fatigue. They were just tired of getting injections. They were just tired of some of the side effects associated with these meds. And so the idea was trying to switch them to pills would be great for compliance because sticking with the medication is really an important part of succeeding with a particular medication. So these new drugs came out. And I think this was a real game changer in managing our patients with multiple sclerosis. And then there was the evolution of these other category of drugs called monoclonal antibodies. And I'll have a slide, well, I'll explain a little bit about what these mean, but I'll just throw out some of these names now and then I'll talk about them in a little more detail. So Tysabri, Lemtrada, Zimbrida, and now uh, Ocrevus, which hasn't been approved just yet, but probably will be approved for the treatment of MS. And they all have these long names that end in the word MAB. So natalizumab, alemtuzumab, diclizumab, and ocrelizumab. And it's not easy learning to say these names. You have to practice them even as a doctor a couple times before or else patients think you don't know what you're talking about. So at night I'm practicing these names to sound coherent. So let's talk a little bit about the interferons. These are real baseline drugs, platform drugs. Uh, Avonex, beta serin, rebif, 
Some of these are once a week, like Avenex, every other day, like beta serum, three times a week, like Rebif. These are uh, category C in pregnancy. Uh, category C is a category that really dis says that there's some animal data, that this drug can be a problem. There's not a lot of human data, this drug can be a problem, but probably should only be used if the risks outweigh the benefits. There is a move from the FDA to try to get away from this letter system and just describe what some of the problems have been identified with the particular drug. Uh, there is uh, concerns about these drugs sometimes affecting your liver. You do need to get some blood work, like white blood cell counts, liver function tests, thyroids, and like many of you in this audience uh, might be familiar, flu-like symptoms, injection site reactions, depression, problems with your liver are all possibilities. I'm not gonna go over, because I've been asked to cover so many different topics, I'm not gonna go over every single drug in detail, but I will, uh, at the end of the talk, be op available to any questions you have any about any specific drug if, if you guys wanna go over that. But I just wanna give a broad overview. So the other drug is glutarimer acetate, which is Copaxone, uh, comes in a 40, 20 milligram daily or 40 milligram three times a week. It's category B which means it's uh, not associated with any animal abnormalities. Uh, there's no drug interactions. There's no laboratory uh, monitoring that's needed. This is actually a pretty simple drug to utilize from a physician or practitioner standpoint because it doesn't require a lot of monitoring, a lot of concerns uh, from a practitioner standpoint. Of course, from an individual standpoint, you get injection site reaction. You can sometimes get what's called an immediate post-injection reaction where you can get some uh, feelings like some chest tightness, feeling uncomfortable. That's not very common, but that can happen. Um, so that's the drug Cropaxone. And then Plegrity, which is a relatively new injectable therapy to the market. And what they've done is essentially this taken Avenex, think of it as a long-acting Avenex. They put this molecule on it. It breaks down a lot slower in your bloodstream and it lasts longer. So it's one injection given under the skin, subcutaneous means under the skin, every two weeks. And for certain patients, that could be very convenient, something they can really stick with and have some success with. So this is uh, the newest injection that's out there. It's uh, Plegrity, uh, interferon beta 1A, and it comes in a pre-filled uh, syringe, you know, injectable uh, that you can do that's an automatic injectable. And so that's fairly convenient for a lot of our patients. So I'm gonna go over some of these drugs now, the pills, and then I'll go over this other category of drugs later. The um, um, first drug I'm going to talk about is Jelenia. Jelenia's got a name called Fingolimod. It's a uh, drug that you take daily. It's a half a milligram pill. It does need, uh, before you get started, some screening of your eyes. You need to check your heart rate, got an EKG. You need to check your white blood cell count. You need to check for whether or not you've had chicken pox exposure. If you haven't, you can get the uh, vaccine for that need to get checked for tuberculosis exposure. A lot of the drugs I'm talking about will mention that um, sometimes when we start to lower your immune system or modify your immune system, if you've had exposure to TB in the past, then that tuberculosis uh, bug organism can come back and be active. So we will talk about that in several other drugs. And then you'll need uh, monitoring. If you start on Jelenia, I don't know if anybody in the audience is on it, for the first six hours after that first dose, which is to check for things like low blood pressure, low heart rate. We did this in the office, and we can still do it in the office, although now the company has come up with a slightly more convenient way to be monitored in the home setting. So for patients uh, under certain circumstances, that might be more beneficial to them. So this is a good drug. Basically what it does is it binds uh, lymphocytes, which are the white blood cells, and keeps them in the lymph glands so they're not circulating as much and affecting your immune system in a negative way so it doesn't have those cells that are activated against your nervous system out in as many numbers in your bloodstream. So you're basically lowering the amount of white blood cells that are active against your uh, nervous system. So the other drug on the market is a drug called Tecfidera. So it comes in this green capsule. The um, drug is uh, 120 milligrams twice a day for the first seven days. Then you go to 240 milligrams twice a day thereafter. So there's a little bit of, an, of a titration. You gotta check white blood cell count with this one. It can also lower your white cell count. You'll need to monitor your white count while you're on treatment. And some patients, 
can get flushing where they get real hot, red, uncomfortable, and then GI distress. That includes things like bloating, diarrhea, uh, and other types of discomfort. So it is um, uh, a drug that's been on the market for several years, generally pretty well tolerated, gives us another option for our patients. And then the other drug I'm going to talk about, the other pill is Albagio, or alteraflunamide. This is a drug that's a once-a-day pill, 14 milligrams, was the dosage. It actually comes in two dosages, 7 milligrams to 14 milligrams, but I'm going to talk about the 14 milligrams because that was the one that showed some effectiveness in reducing the progression of disability, which I think, from my standpoint, certainly is the main reason you want to treat anybody with a disease is to try to reduce their risk of progressing for, uh, with, with more disability. With this one, you're going to need to check blood uh, liver enzymes once a, once a month for the first six months um, while you're on the drug, while you're initiating the drug. Also have to check beforehand to see if you've had uh, exposure to TB. Also uh, want to check your white blood cell count liver function test. It has uh, some side effects like all drugs. You can get headache, diarrhea, hair thinning, and, so, and several others. Um, it also has a very long half-life, which means it stays in your system for a long time. If you have to get this medication out of your system, though, what's convenient is there is a way to bind it in your gut and help to eliminate it. So uh, that's uh, some uh, real value in that. And you can actually measure the drug as it's being eliminated to make sure and have some confidence that it's at a very, very low or undetectable level. It is a category X pregnancy, which means that it's, you know, it's associated with fetal malformations and should not be taken. And um, it is recommended that patients, both females and males, use appropriate birth controls. There can be some of this drug excreted in the semen, and so there is a recommendation that males who are on this drug, who are with a partner and potential for uh, pregnancy, use appropriate barrier birth control. So those are the injections, and those are the uh, medications by mouth. So those are just some basic names, just a brief overview. The take-home message, I think, is that as drugs have evolved, I was talking to someone earlier about that, and they might be a little more effective in some ways, or we start to modulate the immune system in some ways, it will require a little bit more monitoring. So a little bit more blood work up front, maybe some extra tests that you might not expect that you're gonna need uh, compared to the injectables, and then a little bit more monitoring afterwards because of the potential for some side effects. So th that's essential to understand this whole evolution in the treatment of MS, just like the evolution of the treatment of a lot of other diseases as things become a little bit more either complex or sophisticated or have a bigger impact on a particular organ system, you also introduce the potential for much side effects, introduce the potential for more complications. So now I want to talk about what I think is a very exciting and interesting time right now for multiple sclerosis, which is the use of these drugs called monoclonal antibodies. So basically, what is that? So that's where antibodies are developed in the lab to attack a very specific part of your immune system. Cancer therapy has been doing this for a long time, and rheumatologists have been doing this for a long time, and diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and in lupus, we certainly see these drugs for the treatment of uh, lymphomas, leukemias, et cetera. So it's a way to affect your immune system in a more particular way, more specific way, and hopefully have uh, um, a more refined approach to trying to treat the disease you're trying to treat. Classically, you know, just suppressing your immune system with steroids or strong um, chemotherapy drugs where you just try to kill out all the white blood cells and try to lower the immune system is also associated with a lot of other complications. So this idea is if we can target certain cells, maybe we have some success in reducing the disease we're trying to attack and not affect other parts of the immune system. So these antibodies are going to bind to different cells in your bloodstream. And the way we think MS is working is you have cells in your bloodstream. So this is a little schematic or diagram. And you have, this is going to represent the bloodstream, and this is going to represent the brain. Let's just say the brain. And this is what we call the blood-brain barrier. So imagine this is a blood vessel, and you have to get across these cells to get into the brain. 
And these cells, all these different cells, and I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here, but all these different cells have marching orders, let's just say, to cross into the brain and cause some damage. So what you can do is you can bind some of these active cells, receptors, little receptors on the surface of these cells with these MABs, these monoclonal antibodies. And by doing that, you affect the way those cells act or you affect the population of those cells. You can shut them down, you can kill them, you can get the population to be lowered. So if you think about the attack on the nervous system as you have a bunch of white blood cells that have marching orders, and their marching orders is to go into the nervous system and cause damage. If you can select out those cells, or at least the majority of those cells that are predisposed to do that, then you can reduce the number of cells that are gonna go in and cause damage to the nervous system. Does that make sense to people? Is that kind of a reasonable analogy there, right? So there's lots of different ways to do that. And what, so each of these drugs works on different receptors and they affect the way these cells act and or shuts down the population of these cells so you have less movement into the nervous system. So even though this is, to me, really interesting and remarkable that we're at this point where you can modify the immune system like this, um, one of the things that's clear is that none of these treatments are complete. And it really speaks to how complicated the immune system is and how many different players are affected in people with MS. So even these therapies that are effective, they're not 100% effective. They're not curative. So, that, so you know, the people are always like, well, why can't we just get a cure for something? Well, well, because things are really complicated and it's hard to get cures for really complicated things because there's lots of different players. And so as much as this is demonstrating the ability to modify the immune system, what it's also demonstrating is how many different things are going on that are creating problems for our patients with multiple sclerosis. And it's really hard to think of one treatment or one drug or one pill that's gonna make all of this go away. Um, so there's a lot of challenges ahead, but this is a good start, and this is a very interesting start. So drugs like alemtuzumab, which is Lemtrada, affects cells through a particular way of binding to this receptor and lowering this cell population. Other drugs like um, right, uh, uh, ocrelizumab, which is a new drug, affects B cells, which is a different type of lymphocytes. And then there's drugs that prevent these white blood cells from actually binding to the blood vessels, like natalizumab, which is Tysabri. So basically, by affecting the cells, affecting their ability to come into the nervous system, we can have a positive impact on how our patients uh, do with their MS. So Tysabri is a drug that's been around, I believe, since 2003. And I think um, we, uh, many of you might be familiar with that drug. Maybe perhaps some of you are on that drug or have tried that drug. So it's a uh, infusion, 300, uh, 300 milligram infusion monthly, um, generally pretty well tolerated. It um, can create a reaction uh, while you're getting the infusion. It can increase your risk for skin cancer called melanoma. It can have problems with a liver injury. It got a lot of press years ago and continues to with concerns for an infection called progressive uh, multifocal leukencephalopathy, which is basically a virus that's in your body. For many of us, we're carriers of that virus. And when that particular part of the immune system is lowered, it allows that virus to become a little more active and get into the brain and create problems. So it doesn't create an infection, it allows a virus that you're already hosting, you already have in you, to become more pathological or more severe. Now, other drugs have also been associated with the development of progressive uh, multifocal leukoencephalopathy, and I suspect that will be part of our conversations in the future with other drugs as they hit the market, certainly, other fields like rheumatology and oncology have had to deal with this because, again, they're modifying the immune system too and they have to deal with these same consequences. So Lemtrada is a new therapy uh, that's relatively new now. It's an interesting delivery where you get five days of an infusion in, on, on, on the beginning and then one year later 
you come back and you get three days of an infusion, and that's the whole thing. That's the whole treatment. You don't have to keep coming back every month. You don't have to keep coming back every year, and it has a big impact on disease progression. Uh, it's a very convenient administration for patients. You can have an infusion reaction with chills and fevers. You can have a very prolonged low white blood cell count, right? So on purpose, you're trying to lower certain cells, and so when you try to lower certain cells, what happens is your cells are low for a while, so it does increase your risk for potentially for infections. You have to be on an antivirus drug for a while. It increases your risk for thyroid problems, and you need to be monitored for several years after that first infusion because some of these effects on your immune system are not going to go away. Again, going back to my idea that as you try to make treatments perhaps more effective or more sophisticated, you have to accept on the back end more monitoring and or more risk. I don't, I don't think that that, I think that's always the issue with, with uh, these types of treatments. So there's a new drug called Diclizumab, Zimbrida. It's gonna be 150 milligrams uh, subcutaneous under the skin, subcutaneous once a month. Um, it has uh, been associated with some problems with liver dysfunction, so abnormal liver function is gonna be a problem if you have liver disease. This is not the right drug for you. You should not get live vaccines uh, while you're on this drug, and you have to get screened for hepatitis B and C, and again, for tuberculosis, would be reasonable to screen those patients, and you'll need to get liver monitoring while you're on the drug uh, and while you're getting treated. And after you stop the drug, you'll need to continue to get liver monitoring done. So part of these drugs that are coming out, which are more, um, perhaps more convenient, more effective in some ways, again, also requires on the patient side a commitment, a commitment to understand what we're doing for you, a commitment to stick to the monitoring, a commitment to stick to the therapy and the monitoring after you're done with treatment so that you really understand what's gonna go on with you. So it's not just, you know, the doctor saying take this and then you take it. It's, it's a little bit more, a little more complex than that. It has to be a bit of a dialogue and a bit of a relationship there. And now there's a new drug that is not approved yet for the treatment of relapsing or remitting MS. I suspect it will be approved. I believe it is approved or soon to be approved for primary progressive MS. I'm not sure if it's approved just yet for the FDA for primary progressive MS. Uh, but it's called Ocrelizumab. It's going to have a brand name, Ocrevus. And it was uh, effective compared to Rebif in slowing down the rate of uh, disability and relapsing remitting MS. It's a 600 milligram infusion every six months. So it has a pretty convenient infusion uh, routine, which is nice. I mean, you won't have to get treated every single day with this. Um, it's it's uh, showed a slowing down in the rate of progression in patients with primary progressive MS. So this is the first time any drug's been able to show a slowing down in the rate of disease for primary progressive MS. So that's exciting, and it's also uh, affecting a different part of the immune system. So as you can see, and I've been trying to give you guys a very quick history of therapies for MS in a, in a reasonable period of time. We've gone from interferon injections in 1993, and now I believe there's like 13 or 15 available th therapies 15, thank you, available therapies. And it's really, I was just, I was at a meeting this weekend at a little medical conference that I went to this weekend. And I was joking with a friend of mine who's in internal medicine. I said, you know, I'm starting to feel like an internal medicine doctor with hypertension pills because, you know, they had like a thousand hypertension pills to worry about all the time. And we have 15 different therapies. So trying to figure out what's the right drug, what's the right uh, combination maybe of drugs or steps of drugs. If we're on one drug, we're not doing well, what should we switch to next? So there's a lot of unanswered questions. But given the, given the chance of having nothing to treat a patient with MS versus a lot to treat a patient with MS, I'll always take a lot. So I think this is an exciting time. It's a good time. Uh, managing MS symptoms. So I was asked also to talk a little about uh, MS and the challenges of dealing with MS. And again, I think I could probably talk about 45 minutes about any of these topics because each of them is full of lots of uh, different layers to go over. But so the main symptoms of MS, people here with multiple sclerosis, so you know, fatigue, problems with concentration, attention, vision problems, loss of vision perhaps in one eye, double vision, difficulties with speech, problems with swallowing, uh, muscle weakness, muscle stiffness, pain, tingling, urinary dysfunction, 
bowel dysfunction. So there's a whole host of problems that can occur with MS. And any one person can have all of these. And some patients could have just a few of these or minimal amounts of these or may have had these and were fortunate enough to have good enough recovery where these things are not a major part of their day to day. So it's in, earlier today, Stuart mentioned that on his website or the company's website here, they have a patient handout to try to help document or write down what are your concerns when you see the doctor. And I think that's an excellent approach when you come in, is to write down your symptoms, write down what's been concerning you since the last visit. Try, if possible, to separate different areas because often they need to be addressed independently. So perhaps think about what pain problems I have or what bowel and bladder problems I have or what mobility problems I have or what muscle stiffness problems I have or what emotional or concentration problems I have because uh, they're going to be managed in lots of different ways. And, if you, and sometimes they can all get put together and it gets a little overwhelming in the, in the doctor's visit as you're trying to dissect out what the patient's saying and whether or not you think uh, these things are related. Also recognize that medications can sometimes cause side effects that can mimic some of the symptoms you're complaining about. So be open to the idea and remind the doctor also about the meds that you're on because maybe sometimes meds will be contributing to things like lethargy or constipation or mental slowing or depression. You know, a lot of possibilities, right? And then, if possible, try to simplify meds. Uh, always try to find a way to use one medication that might be able to help with two different um, symptoms, if that's possible. That's not always possible. Recognize also, and I mention this a lot, uh, not only to my patients, but I teach residents, and I often uh, try to talk to the residents and explain to them that not every issue is MS related, as many of you may have experienced. I certainly experienced this as a doctor who sees a lot of MS patients. Well, my, you know, I often feel like a family doctor, right? Because once a patient has MS, every other doctor says, well, it's MS, go see the neurologist. So it doesn't matter if you have knee pain, if you have you know, abdominal swelling, uh, it doesn't matter. You have a rash, they want you to take care of everything. And there's the sudden blinders that the other doctors I feel sometimes place on themselves where everything has to be MS related. And that creates a problem where uh, patients are not being seen by the appropriate specialists. And we sometimes have to ferret that out. But on your end, also recognizing that not everything has to be MS related. I mean, you can have leg pain for many reasons and MS may not be that reason. And then trying to find non-medical solution to symptoms. I think that's really important. Um, I don't know if I'm just getting older, which I am, or I've just seen more and more patients. Uh, but as I have moved on in my career, I think I'm, I'm more and more less, I'm less and less inclined to try to prescribe all the time and trying to see what else can we sort of deal with without medications. So for example, fatigue. A lot of patients with MS have fatigue. I don't know, the numbers are something like 80 to 90% of patients with have fatigue. So a couple possibilities are pacing yourself thinking about your day in advance, but also some type of modest exercise often helps patients with their fatigue because a lot of patients get deconditioned. And so the more shape you're in, the more effort every type of activity is. So there's this sort of balance between resting and resting too much and developing the complications of just disuse atrophy and deconditioning, which we would see in patients who don't have MS, patients who have other conditions or patients who just are not apt to wanna try to exercise and improve their level of fitness. Right, so stretches and hydration can relieve some cramps. It doesn't relieve everything, but it might help with the cramps, might help with the spasticity, might avoid you having to take any medications, which is always a good thing. Um, organizing your day and thinking about your day with a little bit of planning often is helpful for things like fatigue and stress, anxieties, because predictability and the ability to plan your day often helps reduce the amount of energy you have to spend on trying to maneuver uh, the events of the day. And then thinking about cognitive behavioral therapy or some other type of supportive therapy, you know, psychological therapy, can help with things like adjusting to the diagnosis or with the anxiety of having a diagnosis, which by nature is unpredictable, and that creates a lot of anxiety in people, especially in the early symptoms. I think as patients move on and come to accept their diagnosis, uh, often that anxiety is diminished. But for some patients, that anxiety is really persistent for a long period of time and really hard to, to handle. 
And then, for example, constipation might improve with hydration and fiber or frequent bathroom breaks might help with urinary urgency. None of these things will help everybody all the time under all circumstances, but they can be part of a solution that might allow individuals to manage their symptoms, have a better quality of life, and not have to depend so much on medications. And then uh, when we talk about uh, medical treatment, common things that we use for uh, Fatigue and depression, of course, stimulants and antidepressants, nerve pain, tingling, burning, stinging, buzzing type sensations can respond to seizure drugs, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and some of the older class of antidepressants, and some of the newer classes, but also some of the older class of antidepressants. Spasticity, muscle stiffness, uh, rigidity in a limb can improve with drugs like baclofen, trizanidine, and Valium use. And uh, ultimately, though, I tell a lot of my patients over time that it's just, it's hard to have MS and not have any symptoms. So the goals are not to make you symptom free. I would love that. I mean, if I could wave a wand and make everybody perfect, that would be fantastic. But that's not realistic. And I think that a lot of the frustrations could sometimes be stemming from expectations. Uh, so trying to manage symptoms to improve the quality of life and trying to identify, if possible, what you want to improve, like for, for what reason? So there's a goal, maybe something to structure the visit around. So I wanna be able to you know, have improvement in fatigue under certain circumstances with my family, or I wanna find a better way to manage my bladder problems so that I have more confidence being outside. Those are kind of more concrete goals, and sometimes that's something you can work around, other than I don't want bladder problems, I never wanna have nerve pain, you know, I don't wanna be fatigued. Well, you know that. That's great, but that's probably not going to be achievable. And if that's the goal you're looking for, every visit will be a sort of exercise in frustration, you know? And then, so managing expectations is essential to developing a healthy outlook with any chronic disease. It doesn't matter whether it's Parkinson's, whether it's a muscular dystrophy, whether it's, you know, MS. We deal with a lot of chronic diseases with some poorly controlled epilepsy, uh, patients with, you know, brain injuries, uh, traumatic brain injuries, uh, strokes. Uh, part of the people who have the healthiest outlook is the people, again, who try to frame, you know, how do I make the day the best I can make it, recognizing I'm still going to have some of the symptoms I have from this neurologic illness. Um, I think, again, if the focus is often on I want everything to go away, um, that, that's rarely going to happen, and it's going to create a lot of uh, frustrations for, for patients. All right. Next up, I got a chance to speak about sexual health. So, uh, sexual health, sexual dysfunction is common in MS. Uh, I was reading a little bit about it here recently in preparation for this. So a lot of people, right, 48% of women, 50 to 90% of men, basically a lot of people will have sexual dysfunction. And you can think about sexual dysfunction lots of different ways. So one way to think about it, one way to conceptualize it is sort of primary dysfunction. Dysfunction in the sexual uh, um, behaviors of the individual related to having multiple sclerosis or related to having a disease of the central nervous system. So that can include loss of interest, loss of libido, apathy. It could be related to uh, decreased or unpleasant genital sensations. Uh, it may just not be as enjoyable to engage in sexual activity. There may be a diminished capacity for orgasm for males and females. There, of course, can be erectile dysfunction in men reduced vaginal lubrication in women. So all these things can contribute to making sexual activity less enjoyable. And in fact, uh, there may be no interest, uh, loss of interest in sex, which may be a bother to the individual or may not be a bother to the individual. The individual may be very comfortable having sort of this new asexual kind of life, but it may be a problem for the um, partner. So um, that's something to think about. So secondary dysfunction is basically how does the disease that the individual has uh, might affect the engaging in sex, which is a sort of secondary to problems related to it. For example, having too much fatigue, having spasticity, which may affect the ability for the individual to uh, uh, engage in certain sexual activities, uh, bladder dysfunction, medication side effects, which might affect sexual performance and arousal. So it's a lot of different things. So it's sort of the, the nervous system effect on the sexual system, and then just having the disease and how uh, some of the complications of that disease, whether it's medication, whether it's maybe some physical uh, limitations, 
um, affect sexual activity. And then uh, the last thing is kind of the psychological effect. Disability uh, may affect the way you see yourself, feeling unattractive, feeling not like a sexual individual, believing sexuality is not compatible with disability, being not interested in sex, it might have, you know, may have problems with the partner, also not feeling either attracted to the other individual or feeling like perhaps sexual activity is not is a trivial issue or it's something that shouldn't, they shouldn't be pursuing given the severity of their overall uh, condition of their partner, that perhaps it's, 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 it's frivolous or it's something that that person shouldn't be, or it's selfish to be pursuing that. But in fact, you know, that could be working very much against the relationship. You know, if the one per person's sh uh, cautious about wanting to engage in sex because they think they're trying to uh, spare their partner from, from this activity, and then the other partner might say, well, this person's not interested in sex with me. Maybe they don't find me attractive. And they both might be thinking about things very differently, and they're not really communicating. So that would be a sort of a different problem with sexual dysfunction. And they might very well be able to engage in sex. There may be no real physical limitations, but it may just be a perception problem about should I even be talking about this? How am I going to be perceived bringing this up? Is this a, and then the other person might be saying, why aren't they bringing this up? And what, hap you know, what happened to us? So there's a lot of potential ex uh, problems that can occur. Not just in MS, although I was asked to talk about MS, but we see this with, with every disease. And so lots of treatments, right? Uh, treatment options include oral medications for erectile dysfunction. We've all seen you know, hundreds of uh, commercials on TV for these products, lubricants. Uh, sexual aids can often help problems like loss of sensitivity, uh, changing traditional sexual activities with the partner, reviewing medications, and of course, you know, evaluating gynecologic and neurologic dysfunction, I think, is really important. Um, and discussing possibly some psychological counseling or working with a sex therapist. So problems with sexual activity and sexual health and MS might have some specific issues, but really you could see that in, in patients with other problems, patients who've had strokes who are uh, paralyzed on one side, uh, patients who've had you know, surgeries where there's uh, maybe some disfigurement there's a lot of these themes don't, are not unique to MS. These, these are common themes in having uh, an illness and affecting the way you perceive yourself, the way your partner perceives themselves now in the relationship and perceives the relationship. In general, much of this can be overcome. Not everything, but much of it can be. And so I've always liked this quote. I forgot where I heard this quote, but that was great. It says, sex is like money in a relationship. It isn't a problem until you don't have any. And uh, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. You know, people say, well, sex isn't that important, and you know, the person's impaired in this way, and I have to, but, but over time, it can have a, a real corrosive effect on the relationship. And so I think it's an important thing to bring up and think about, um, and because that also affects the individual who's ill with their self-esteem, and creates a lot of relationship tension, and also you know, affects the other, in the other partner, the other caretaker, let's say, uh, perception about what their role is now in their relationship. So um, it's very reasonable to talk about these issues. So just to review, thinking about sexual health with an illness, you have to think about, do you think this is related primarily to the impact of the illness and its effect on the sexual, uh, let's say the sexual um, organs or sexual libido? And then there's the question of, is it complications from having the condition that it makes sex more difficult, or is it uh, more of a psychological uh, behavioral problem about engaging in sex with uh, their condition or with their partner? That makes sense, the different ways to think about this? I hope, all right. And then I was also asked to talk a little bit about MS and pregnancy. So to summarize it, MS has no impact on fertility. People with MS are not at a lower rate of having children. Um, contraceptive use does not affect multiple sclerosis. It doesn't make your MS worse. It doesn't make you have, uh, it doesn't make you have problems with more relapses. And there's no poor pregnancy outcomes in women. So in other words, women who, have, uh, who are pregnant with multiple sclerosis are not at a higher than average risk of developing um, miscarriages or having fetal malformations or having complicated deliveries, or, or having a higher rate of cesarean sections, et cetera. So there's really, fun, basically, there's no real impact of getting pregnant with MS. So 
the issue sometimes is uh, activity of the multiple sclerosis during pregnancy. So there's a decrease in activity of relapses during the third trimester and after delivery, a rebound effect about three months afterwards in patients with MS. Although you often and usually don't need to place patients on treatment during pregnancy, you can use steroids for a relapse after the first trimester, and there has been some off-label use of a drug, uh, Copaxone, during pregnancy in certain patients. There have also been some studies looking at uh, treatment with something called intravenous immunoglobulins if you thought patients were particularly active. But in general, uh, you're not uh, compelled to treat, and I don't treat patients during their pregnancy on medications except perhaps with a very, very rare circumstance. Uh, and most patients are likely to do well during their pregnancy, and it's really after delivery that you have to worry about the potential for relapse. There is, however, uh, with regards to pregnancy, um, you know, wearing, washing out of the medications, right? So there has to be some, ideally some coordination with your doctor that you're considering some family planning, you're planning to have a baby, you are, want to stop your medications, get those medications out of the system before you get pregnant. In my personal practice, typically right after I have that discussion, I got a call the week le next week, doctor, I'm pregnant. And that fact, they just happened to me two months ago. So uh, um, we had had her on a lot of meds. She had had some struggles. She finally was pretty stable. She was thinking about having a baby for 2016, 2017. I said, well, let me know when you guys are real serious about it. We'll get you off the meds. You guys can start you know, um, working on it from there on. And she called back like a week later. She said, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant now. I said, well, congratulations. Let's get you off the meds. But you know, ideally, she, I, mean, I would not have wanted her on the meds, but that's just the way it is. And then let's see, uh, there's, like I said, no increased risk of uh, delivering complications. Now, a lot of people also, this is interesting, for a lot of people, I did not know this number, I didn't have this number memorized. Uh, so patients, if you have MS, the risk that your child is gonna have MS is about two to 2.5% chance. So that's higher than the general population, but it's not this overwhelming risk. So a lot of parents worry that if I have MS, my kid's got like some 50-50 chance of having MS, and that's not, not the case at all. So last topic, I know I've been talking a lot, because I was asked to talk about a lot of things. Uh, urinary dysfunction, so there's a couple different ways to also to think about urinary dysfunction. Uh, increased frequency or urgency, uh, hesitancy, hard time starting your stream, excessive nighttime urination, incontinence, and inability to empty your bladder completely, right? So part of it, when you think about it, I have a hard time with you know, peeing, you have to kind of ask yourself, and I'll ask my patients, well, you know, what does that mean exactly? And we try to divide it. Basically, it is there a hard time holding your urine or a hard time starting your stream? Let me try to figure it out from there. Sometimes, however, that's not enough, and you're going to need to try to get some more uh, uh, testing. So when we drink water, just to go over some basic anatomy, when we drink water, the bladder expands. That sends a signal up to your brain that your bladder is full. And then you want to empty your bladder. And we send a signal to the bladder that makes your, your bladder contract and makes your sphincter open, kind of like a water balloon. You're squeezing one end of the water balloon, you're letting open the neck of the water balloon, and the urine's coming out. So that's the way normal uh, urinary function works. So uh, we have problems here. We're drinking water. Bladder gets big, sends a signal up to the brain, says, I need to pee, and then your brain sends a signal down, squeezes the bladder, and opens the sphincter. And when there's a problem between this muscle squeezing and the sphincter opening in synchrony, we can develop problems, right? We have a hard time sometimes emptying our bladder. This one's closed, this one's pushing down, you feel like you can't empty your bladder. Or this one's opening up too much, uh, and you're dribbling and you're having accidents. And you sometimes need to get some more detailed urologic evaluation. So be, frequent bathroom breaks can be helpful. Avoiding caffeine. Caffeine is a diuretic. It makes you want to pee. Uh, pelvic floor exercises can often help with these muscles here around the sphincter to help you with retaining urine. In general, most people are live their lives more comfortable being able to retain their urine than to have incontinence. So in general, it is easier to get out and about and find ways to manage your urinary problems if you can hold your urine while incontinence creates greater distress in social situations. I think we can all sort of relate to that fact. And then uh, medicines, just throw out the names, Detrol, Sanctura, Vesicare, Ditropin, these are common drugs. You can discuss that with your doctor, discuss with your urologist. And I think I am done. Stuart is smiling, kind of, in the back. All right, thank you. Uh, anybody here have questions for Dr. Sir? 
Don't be shy. Um, I attend a lot of these, and many times they say that it modifies the um, any of the drugs, specifically the monoclonal antibodies. They modify the immune system. Right. I recently heard someone say that it actually changes your DNA. Changes it's, your DNA? Yes. Is that... Yeah, I don't think that's a true statement. A, transi- a translation of it? No? Yeah, okay. I don't think that's a true statement. No, okay. I wouldn't say that. It, it, it could change uh, cells, populations, some of these drugs. I mean, each one did a little bit different. I tried to show that to you. So I don't know. But, but uh, you're basically modifying the, the activity and or the sort of the number of some of those drugs. And I think like in the case, so perhaps what you were talking about in the case of Lemtrada, I think there's some of the cell populations come back with a slightly different uh, sort of marching orders in a way. So, but I don't know if that really changes their DNA. I think it just changes the way they're activated differently. Using any of those anyways, but is it specifically Lemtrada or is it any of the MABs, the monoclonal antibodies? Right, they're all modifying your immune system. Okay. They're not causing immunosuppression. They're not, you're not, it's not like a hardcore chemotherapy where they're trying to kill all your white cells. They're okay. just trying to modify and affect activated cells that have a propensity to be more active. So cells that are more activated have a different behavior than cells that are kind of more passive. Yeah. Okay, we have another one over here, and then we have another one over there. That's great. Right. Thank great you. talk. Thank you. Uh, I have um, a problem at, at uh, during the day. I can knock the porcelain off the john. Okay, during the nighttime, I get up, and I have a problem. You know, completing bladder, and I have to stand there for five minutes, if not more. So one thing to think about is. Uh, being seen by a urologist and just double checking to make sure there's nothing else, you know, prostatic problems with prostate would be an issue. Um, and then, of course, there are medications that can release or re- reduce or relax some of the uh, sphincter tone. So most medications are designed to tighten your sphincter a little bit because, again, it's easier to live your life not having accidents than, than the other way around. But that's something you can explore with a urologist. Yes. I have two questions. Um, first on Lemtrada, after the two years, um, is that it with Lemtrada, or do they know that you have to go back on it again, or does it just end after that? Uh, for now, the answer is it just ends. There's no like letter- literature about people going back and getting on the drug. But I mean, if you're not, if you need to do more therapy, you just go on something else, or? Well, that's a good question. I. I don't know the immediate answer to that. I think we'd have to figure out um, whether or not um, that would be, uh, I think the short answer is I don't know. Um, but I think you'd have to consider if someone had breakthrough disease after being treated with Lemtrada, you know, it's a pretty aggressive course and you have to try some other type of therapy for them. And then on Tosabri, how long can you be on Tosabri for? Right, so the, the big limiting factor with Tysabri has been this JC virus presence. So not everybody is JC virus positive. So if you're not JC virus positive, you can be on a Tysabri for a long, long period of time. Well, I was JC. For years. I'm on Tysabri now, and I was JC virus positive from the beginning. And they test me every time I go in and everything. Yeah. And I'm still on it, and it's been helping. So I didn't know how long. Right, so your risk goes up. Uh, if uh, depend- So they do, there's a... There's a way to take a look if you're positive and look at what they call the index. In other words, how positive are you? And then, but, but, but basically at about 24 months, I think it's usually when you start to review with the patient the risks and benefits of staying on Tysabri if they're positive for uh, JC virus. So 24 months. But if you're JC virus negative, I have a patient that's been on it now for uh, probably about six, seven years now, and she's doing fine. We just test her and watch her. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody? Any other questions? Thank you. I don't know if I missed it, something that says, but where do you practice? Where do I practice? I practice in Maitland, Florida, in a group called Neurology Associates, and that's where both me and uh, Trisha practice. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
You talked about PML. Yeah. And now uh, you got the Herbie virus out there. This, and both of them stays dormant. Yes. Can MS stay dormant until a some, some until something triggers it? Yeah, I don't know that that's uh, the way I think about MS. I mean, you really just think about MS as uh, just a dysregulation of your immune system that attacks your brain. Now, there are people who do very well and don't have a lot of active disease, but I wouldn't say that they're dormant. I mean, I think they just may not be lucky. They just may not have a very aggressive form of, of MS. Just, just curious, um, <clears throat> who was working on the, more, the cleaner drugs? In other words, a lot of these medications seem to have that shotgun effect of hitting everything. And I know in um, psychiatric medications, they've gotten cleaner and cleaner drugs. Is that what you all are working on or they are working on, is working towards getting cleaner drugs so that they don't hit everything? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think that there's a move towards trying to target, I don't know if it's cleaner, but I think they're just trying to target cells in the immune system that might be the biggest drivers, uh, the big, having the biggest impact. On, you mean like those MABs? Yeah, exactly, having the biggest impact on trying to reduce the, uh, the damage of your immune system attacking your nervous system. So, but I think there's a lot of incomplete, you know, a lot of incomplete understanding about MS. Can I just ask a follow-up to yeah. that? Um, with the MABs, what you've been, we're talking about, if they're adding another, if they're adding another uh, piece to the molecule to prevent it from going into the, you know, passing right. the blood-brain barrier, I'm assuming, unless it's killing it, it's going to leave those molecules outside the blood-brain barrier, what happens to them? You know what I'm saying? If yeah. they start to congregate there, because now they're not going... Right. Well, I mean, what can happen is... Uh, well, what will happen, those cells will be there. Those cells are still sort of triggered to attack, and they just can't go in. But one, one of the things that could happen, for example, is uh, you could see if you stop, for example, the uh, Tysabri treatment, and, and, you, and there's not some transition plan, those patients can have a relapse afterwards because now you've still got this. Could you've got a build up of those molecules? Yeah, well, actually, cells live for a while and they die out, but there's more cells kind of getting programmed. So it's not that this, it's not like this ever increasing amount of cells out there. But if you don't have a transition plan for a patient off Tysabri, you can see like a rebound effect with a worsening relapse afterwards. Gotcha. Thank you. Very little comes out. If I get up and walk around, I've got to go again, really, really bad. Again, not much comes out. What is that? Right. So when you have to, you feel like you frequently have to go to the bathroom, but when you try to go, a, a low volume comes out. Right. It's like your bladder is not emptying. Right. So that's probably what's going on. You're probably getting the feeling that your bladder is expanding quickly and it'll be contracting, like trying to avoid, but the sphincter is not relaxing. And so I, I don't know that, but I mean, just, you know, just listening to that story, I can't tell you for certain, uh, but that'd be the first thing. So uh, trying to find a way to uh, maybe relax that sphincter might be a way to help you empty your bladder easier, but you might need more detailed urologic tests like urodynamics, where they actually pour some wa water into your bladder and see how it expands and see what, how quickly it's, it's, uh, it's reflexively contracting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Anybody here have a question? Any self-help groups here that have a question? I just had a question regarding Ty Sabri. If you're switching, if, you, if it's decided that you switch from Ty Sabri to another drug, right. then is there a half-life, is that a long life for Tysabri? Do you have to be without a drug for an amount of time? Or So it would be reasonable to hold Tysabri for some shorter period of time, maybe like four to eight weeks, but probably more like four weeks, and then switch you to something else. Um, I haven't been on medications for probably some years. Um, I had allergic reactions to beta seron and rebif, and mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know. I've, I keep getting these um, X-ray, uh, um, I'm sorry, MRIs where there's no active lesions, and I was wondering, can you still be developing the disease when it's not showing any active lesions? 
Right. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's always possible you can develop some disease, but if you've been stable, you could also be, there's a small minority of patients who are fortunate and just have what they call benign MS, which after several years, just don't have a lot of progression of disease, and that might be the category you're in. But, it, but you could still have a risk of developing symptoms in the future. I've been on Copaxone since 2005. My doctor said that he would pull me off around 45 or so. That'll be next year. Around f- the age of 45? Is that around, what the yeah, 45 we're talking about? Yeah, closer to 50. Oh. So what do you do after that? You look, do you look for another drug or, do you, or you just sit and wait? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I would probably transition somebody to a different drug. I mean, not knowing all the specifics about everybody's cases, but I wouldn't consider just not treating at the age of 45. I don't think there's anything magical about being, having 40, being 45 years old and not treating somebody. You get closer to an older age and you just, okay, you're getting older, so you're going to go downhill. And I don't look downhill, so, I mean, will you yeah, give I, up? I don't, I don't, I don't know, know that, um, again, I don't know that there's any good reason to not treat somebody after the age of 45. So I don't know that I, I'm not sure I understand the whole, you know, logic. Okay. So let's thank Dr. Issa for being here today. Thank you.